welcome everyone. Midterm break, so close, we can almost taste it. But uh, before we get there, we need to talk about buffer overflow attacks and uh, how they work, what that means, how we protect against them. Uh, but before that, uh, I'd like to show you uh, these birds here. Uh, the American oyster catcher. Uh, it's when they're uh, resting like this, you can't see, but they have kind of large traffic cone colored bills. Uh, and they are uh, uh, one, one curious thing here is that this bird uh, has research bands. So some, some scientists are doing you know something with this oyster catcher. Uh, and as the name suggests, they go around and grab mollusks or oysters or other similar creatures, and they can actually pry them out of the shells uh, with their beak. Uh, this one also research bands in the spot. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this oyster catcher did not stick around to eat it, and it escaped with its snack. All right, that's, that's our, our welcoming bird. Uh, any questions on... Uh, the lab, any of the assembly or procedure stuff we've been talking about. All right, so to get started talking about buffer overflow attacks, uh, let's talk about what is a buffer. When I say we have a buffer, uh, Suggestions on, on what that means. Bye. Yeah, I'm thinking that it's kind of like, I mean, it depends on the, the, the context of it, but it always seems to be kind of like a conceptual like safety mat. Like it, it's like a, it protects things like you got that. Yeah, we often have the word buffer used this way as like some sort of padding or kind of extra uh, room or space. Uh, that's not quite the idea uh, that we're going to be talking, we're using buffer with here, Lev. Like if we're waiting to process something, we might throw in the buffer. So perhaps the buffer is like user inequity or something like that. Yeah, that, that's getting to, to what we mean here. In this context, a buffer is just an array for temporary data. So to the point of, of user input or any kind of input output, of, uh, the, that data might be kind of temporarily stored in some array, either before it's processed or before it's sent out, uh, and that array would be called a buffer. Um, and this also gets used as a verb. We describe uh, some process as buffered or some data as buffered if it can sort of build up in one of these temporary arrays uh, as, as it goes along. Um, I, uh, you, you've probably heard the term uh, buffering applied to kind of a video online that sort of loads, we say that's buffering. Uh, that is literally the process of the bytes for that video being put in some temporary array so that then it can be played. So kind of video buffering is building up enough data in some, in some place so that it can actually play the video. Um, then I mentioned These are often going to be used to store user input. That we are going to get some string, some input from the user, and we're going to stick it in some, uh, in some array, some array of characters. So that brings us to the idea of buffer overflow. And there are a few parts uh, that go into this phenomenon. First, is it possible to go past the end of an array in C? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's no bounds checking at all. So we can write past the end of an array and kind of at the most basic sense, this is all a buffer flow overflow is. We had some buffer, it was gonna hold some temporary data, and we overflowed it. We kind of wrote data past kind of the end of the, the space and memory that had been allocated for this array. Um, we're thinking about these buffer overflows in a kind of more specific context, that of computer security uh, and software vulnerability more generally. Uh, and so, We have observed that the return address for the current function and for any function is stored on the stack. And so these two facts together means that if we have a stack allocated buffer and if we write past the end of the buffer, what might happen? Okay. Just over, like right over the return address. Exactly. So because the return address is on the stack and we can have one of these buffers on the stack and there's nothing to stop us writing past the end of it, we can overwrite our return address. So just to kind of put a picture to what this might look like. I'm going to imagine this is our, our stack and for this diagram kind of each cell here is going to be a single byte. So We might have uh, eight bytes of our return address here. If our if our return address is hex four hundred six seven zero, and we know that it's an address on a sixty-four bit system, so we'll take out these eight bytes. What byte is going to appear first? If our return address is 400670, so this is our address, it's an 8 byte memory address, and we're storing in these 8 bytes, which byte's going to come first? Exactly. We're on a little Indian system, so the least significant byte comes first. So we'll see 70, and then what will be next? 06. 40, and then the rest, all zeros. Does that make sense? So say that we then have our buffer, something like this, and we take some input from the user, uh, and the user inputs hello, and then uh, we would put in H E L L O. Would there be anything else here? Huh? But why isn't it uh, hello the other way around? Because it's a, a little Indian. Yeah, great question. Uh, Indianness affects the bytes within a single element. So within a single address. Elements. And so this is five separate elements, each of which is one byte. And so the array elements always appear in sort of index zero this first. Um, are these the only five characters in the string, Kelly? 
Exactly. We also have our null terminator. So here, life was good, everything was fine, no, no problems. Uh, but if instead the user had entered hello bird, we then have a space B I R T null terminator. And now our return address is 40 is from replacement 0, 0 is 6 with the hex value for D, uh, and 70 with the hex value for C. And so it is completely blasted over our return address. And then were this function to get to its return instruction, it would still you know, take the eight bytes um, uh, that were the return address and try and you know, return to wherever that is. Um, could, could cause all sorts of problems. Does this make sense? Questions on this? So these, uh, yeah, these. So the pulse part of the memory to read it back a lot of times in the key letters, the buffers are in between the two. Uh, this is all on the stack. Because our return addresses are stored on the stack. So for a buffer overflow to affect a return address, the buffer has to be on the stack. Can you tell me again what exactly is a return address? Uh, a return address is the memory address of the instruction we'll execute when this function returns. Um, so, in particular, our ret instruction Take whatever is stored at RSP and pop that those eight bytes into our instruction pointer, and then that will be the address of the next instruction we'll execute. So, in one scenario, would the buffer would the buffer actually like overflow? Does this mean that like you would then allocate an enough memory on the stack for the buffer, or like what does what 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 causes that? Yes. Yeah, so, that's that's a good question. We're going to get to an example. We're going to look at several examples today, uh, but the short version it requires. Uh, in this scenario, we took user input, and we didn't do anything to prevent the user from entering more data than we had room for. I think. Um, I just had a quick question about return. Mm -hmm. um, so it would just pop whatever is like the top of the stack. So if you like push a couple more times when you pop, then it might just, okay, so it doesn't always, okay, yeah. Yeah, this has a baked in assumption that the other instructions in the function, you don't get to return until RSP has been kind of moved back to where it started the function. Because again, otherwise you're just taking some random stuff. And, Trying to use it as, as the address of the next instruction. Other questions? So, problems like this, these buffer overflows, um, because there's you know important and interesting data like the return address that's stored on this act that can potentially be overwritten, uh, an attacker can uh, basically just by engineering what they input affect important data that's on the stack. Um, and for a long time, uh, this was the number one technical vulnerability in software. Uh, I say technical because the number one vulnerability in almost every case is people. Um, if you can trick someone into giving you uh, their username and password or kind of otherwise uh, manipulate people, uh, that's far and away how most systems are compromised. Uh, but buffer overflow is major technical vulnerability. So let's look at a piece of code. 
function uh, called gets. Uh, it takes in a pointer to a character, dest, which is where it's going to store the input that it reads from the user. Uh, and this get char function is just going to get a single character that someone has typed in on the terminal uh, and return that character. And so we can see that we get one character from the user. We have this pointer p that we are at, is at the start of this destination array. Uh, and then while we haven't read an end of file character, uh, which is a, a special thing on uh, Linux systems to indicate like the input is over. Uh, and we haven't read a new line. So we're going to kind of keep reading characters from the user until uh, we see that there is a signal that there's no more input or that we get to the end of a line. And each time we read a character, we're going to store that character at the pointer p and then increment p to the next character. And this increment takes place after we copy C to where P currently points to, then we read a new character. Once we've seen one of these things that indicates we're done reading, we put in the null terminator and return. So first questions on this code, does this kind of loop and how it's reading in a character at a time make sense? Kevin? Uh, I just have a quick question. So what is Get char doing in the first one. Like, what, what, what is get char? Uh, get char is a function that gets a single character that someone has typed in on the terminal. So why are we storing it as an int char? Uh, I guess this could be char. Um, I mean, we're yeah. So that that should be char. Um, yeah, does not need to be an int. Other questions? What could go wrong were we to execute this function? Uh, the input that your system intended is going to be wrong and just capture a stop level of the process? Yeah, there's no, there's no notion of how much memory has been allocated for dest here. And this function does, like, takes does not take that into account. It's just reading in input from the user uh, until it sees a certain character. And so dest could have, we could have allocated one byte or 10,000 bytes for dest, we don't know. And this function also doesn't know. It's just going to read in however much the user puts in. Um, so is this OK? Is this a problem? Yeah, it's not good. We uh, we tend to, to not not yeah. like functions like this. That uh, you know, we have to somehow know in advance exactly how much memory we need to execute for desk. But the user, especially a malicious one, could always kind of enter more data than we because we can't allocate an infinite amount. And there's nothing to prevent the user from entering an unlimited number of characters. So that's not great. Um, this gets is a real function from the C library. And on Mantis, if I bring up the manual page for gets, explains that it kind of reads a string from standard in. But if I go down to the bottom in the bug section, never use gets. <laughs> Uh, it's, it is extremely dangerous to use. It has been used to break computer security. You should use this other function, fgets, instead. So what's better about fgets? Importantly, you can tell it how much it should read. You can actually tell it, stop after reading this many characters. Don't just blindly keep writing user input to memory, uh, potentially forever. Oh. Why does the other one still exist? Why does that still exist? Um, so imagine there have been uh, uh, people who have been writing C programs for two decades. Some of them use GIFs. Uh, 
we then strike it from the standard library. What's going to happen to the kind of two decades worth of programs, some of which you know people are depending on to like run accounting systems and book plane tickets and anything else we're having computers do? Yeah, they're gonna they're all gonna break. Um, so we can't just remove it. Uh, if we want to have like programs that were written in the past still potentially work. Um, but what, uh, what we can do uh, and what the, the, C comp the C compiler's solution to this is to say, okay, if we'll get into all the things going on in this command line, but just to show what happens when I try and compile a program that uses gets, First, it claims that gets doesn't exist. <laughs> Turns out it does exist, but then says, warning, gets function is dangerous and should not be used. This is what GCC does. Uh, the, the other major C compiler called Clang doesn't give you this warning, but then when you run a program that uses gets, it then prints out the warning when the program runs saying, like, by the way, this program uses gets and is unsafe. So there's lots of stuff to stop people from writing to try and stop people from writing new programs with this. Uh, but if we want old programs to still work, we're sort of stuck um, not breaking them. Other questions? Come on. So what happens if you ignore the warnings and like right now you need to do uh, Yes, yeah, so let's actually look at this program here that I'm compiling. So this is the, the main part of the, the program uh, that uh, I want to, to demo. Uh, there is a function that calls a function, this function echo. Echo allocates a quite small stack allocated buffer of eight bytes. Calls gets to read in user input into that buffer. And then calls puts, which is like a, a very simple version of printf. Without all the formatting, it just takes whatever string you give it and prints it out. So it's called echo because it's going to just print out, kind of echo back whatever input you put in. But uh, this program, um, as the compiler was warning me, is incredibly insecure. Uh, so let's take a look at um, what the assembly for this echo function looks like. Uh, no, not this one. This one. All right, so we are allocating 16 bytes on the stack uh, after pushing kind of the old value RBX being Kali saved. Uh, we load uh, in this case, the address of our buffer, which is sort of eight bytes above the top of the stack, um, into RBX. That way we can reuse RBX later. Uh, then we move that pointer to the start of the buffer into RDI to pass it to gets, move it again into RDI to pass it to puts. So basically just uh, the, the thing to take away from this is we know how much space is being allocated on the stack. It's 16 bytes, and we know where within that the buffer is. It's 8 bytes um, away from, from the top of the stack. Using this information, I can uh, kind of create a sort of spreadsheet view of the stack in this case. This is the same sort of uh, sort of zigzag uh, memory diagram that you may remember from the beginning of the term, where the address here is the address of the first byte in that row, and then kind of one byte away, one byte away from here, two bytes away from here, up to seven away from here, and then you know, this is the address of the start of the next row. So you kind of zigzag the way up, and we know that at the um, kind of through GDB, I can kind of figure out exactly what stack addresses are used here, where at the start of the function, there's a return address of 4056A that's stored uh, in these eight bytes. We then push 
the old value of RB, RBX onto the stack. Then we have the eight bytes of our buffer and then eight unused bytes. So this is the state of, uh, of the stack kind of before the echo function is run. Uh, questions on, on this? Do the different parts of this make sense? All right, let's see what happens when I run this program. Just now waiting for my input. And if I input one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sort of fill up the eight bytes of the buffer, uh, and then a null terminator at the end, um, and then I fill up seven more bytes, it echoes back, it's just fine. Because what I have done is I have put one, two, three, and I'm putting in the hex values for these. Kind of hex 31 is the, the character one, hex 32 is the character two, and so on. Hex 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. And then I was overwriting the value of RBX that had been pushed onto the stack. So I'm overwriting data that I'm not supposed to. Uh, but in this case, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, and the null terminator. I have didn't overwrite anything that was essential. I changed the value of RBX, um, but return address stayed untouched, so the function kind of was able to return normally. This buffer overflow did not kind of cause a problem in this particular, uh, particular case. Uh, but if I do that again, adding one more character, I get a segmentation fault. And I can look at, okay, well, I put in an eight here, and then I told you that the return address was um, 6A0540. And so what did I change about the return address when I, and I went from 3700 to then adding this eight? Marcus? Um, you just replaced the 6A with null terminator. Exactly, I changed the return address from 4056A to 400500. Uh, and so the function returned to 400500, it just so happened uh, it just so happens that uh, 400, 500 is actually the address of another function uh, that was that is part of this program. Uh, so it's actually when that other function that we just happened to return to tries to return, it uses some garbage that's on top of the stack and causes a segmentation fault. So uh, with, if we actually step through this in, um, in GDB, Put a break at our echo function and then run. And one aside I want to point out here is several of you have asked me, is it possible to step backwards in GDB? And I have told all of you that it's not possible. And I learned yesterday this is a total lie. It is possible. <laughs> uh, the thing that you have to do is you have to tell GDB to record the steps you're doing because then it can go backwards. It can't go backwards by default. So if I say to record, and then say layout assembly, and then I can say kind of next die, next die, next die, and then I can say reverse next die, and go back. But it can only go back to the point where I started recording. So that I was very excited to find this out. I apologize for, for not being aware of it. Um, courtesy of a, a rabbit hole I went down after uh, yesterday's CST talk. Turned out to be a productive, uh, productive one. Anyway, so can uh, go forward. It's now waiting for my input. And put in this one here. Refresh to 
fix the display. It's going to print it out. And so I do next i pops rvx off. So now right before I return, I should be able to kind of examine what is stored at RSP because that's about what is about to be used as the return address. And I see like uh, we expected it's been changed to 400, 500 by that null terminator that got written to part of the return address. Uh, and so if I next I here, turns out 400, 500 just happened to be the address of this um, kind of function that is part of the like shutting down when a program is, is finished running, it runs this sort of uh, function that, that deallocates some of the structures that were related to running the program. Um, so it's just happens to now start executing here. So instead of returning to the call echo function like it was supposed to, we messed with the return address and it just, you know, the RET instruction did what it does, pop what was ever on top of the stack into the instruction pointer and away we go. And we can step through what this is doing and we can right before it returns, we can see that what's on top of RS, what's on top of the stack is just some, some nonsense data that's sort of not, I don't think, being used for anything. And then when that returns, uh, we get a segmentation fault because now we're trying to execute uh, an address that's on the stack. And the stack does not have execute permissions. Um, that is, in fact, the origin of this phrase, segmentation fault. These different regions of memory, stack, heap, uh, global data, code, etc. These are called segments of memory, and a segmentation fault is your memory access has broken one of the rules about these segments. It's either outside any of the valid segments, or we're trying to execute something that we can't execute within one of the segments, something like that. So if you, like, stereotypically, if you write the correct, overwrite with the correct address, then you'll be successful. That's right. So if we, like, if we overflow the buffer and we overwrote the return address with the, like, the, ret the same bytes that were already there, there would be kind of no effect on the program. So they would still, they would still use those as, as the return address. What other questions do you have about this? All right, so uh, that's um, our uh, buffer overflow in practice. Uh, there's one more kind of uh, there's one more kind of attack that I want to talk about. Some real world examples, uh, and then I want to touch on how do we defend against these. Um, uh, but before we get there, uh, there's some firsts in U.S. history that I need to tell you about today. Um, we've, uh, the, the Civil War is over, uh, reconstruction in the southern states has begun, and uh, as you might expect during any period of uh, tremendous social change and uh, uh, people getting uh, rights that they had never had before, in this case uh, former slaves, there are lots of firsts. Here we have the first uh, black lieutenant governor, Oscar Dunn, uh, the first uh, black man uh, elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, John Menard. Uh, Hiram Rebels was the first black U.S. senator. Uh, in fact, Mississippi at this during this period had uh, both its senators uh, were African Americans. Uh, and then uh, this is Thomas Peterson, uh, who may have been its hard to, to, to know for sure, but may have been the first person, uh, uh, the, the first uh, black person to uh, cast a vote uh, once, that had, once that right had been granted to uh, by the 15th Amendment. Uh, he lived in New Jersey. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of firsts, as I say. And another kind of uh, first uh, in this period was uh, U.S. states being administered by the U.S. military. So uh, the federal government divided uh, the former Confederate states up into five military districts, and the U.S. Army occupied these areas and were responsible for kind of administering the government and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, restoring uh, 
uh, American institutions. Um, and uh, this, there was a tremendous amount of violence and conflict uh, in these states during this period, uh, largely uh, driven by organizations like the Ku, Ku Klux Klan or the White League uh, that attempted to overthrow or otherwise interfere with the government, uh, the new state governments, and, and uh, the rights of, of free slaves. This is uh, a drawing of uh, an, attack, uh, uh, an attack in New Orleans where kind of 5,000 uh, armed members of, of the White League showed up to overthrow the government and battled police and, and militia. Um, and the, uh, under Ulysses S. Grant, the federal government um, was largely successful in kind of uh, suppressing and destroying the Ku Klux Klan, uh, but over the next uh, 10, 10 to 15 years, uh, the U.S. public basically got tired of this effort to preserve civil rights in the South um, and wanted to move on and public support uh, 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 waned, and so you had the uh, uh, election of 1876, uh, where uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, sometimes uh, called by his critics Rutherford Fraud, uh, because uh, this was an election where neither candidate won enough electoral college votes to win. So the House of Representatives got to uh, 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 decided to kind of give the Republican-controlled House of Representatives gave Hayes. Um, uh, uh, the presidency in exchange for ending Reconstruction in the South. Um, and kind of this political cartoon shows uh, Hayes kind of, uh, walking off with uh, a woman labeled uh, the Solid South. Uh, and this character here is Roscoe Conkling, an influential New York uh, politician uh, who uh, facilitated this, this so-called corrupt bargain uh, Conkling, very interesting fellow, um, uh, was uh, unusually for the time, very into physical fitness and did a lot of boxing and, and horseback riding. Um, and uh, here's a cartoon that, that shows him trying to like uh, figure out the puzzle of Republican politics as a sort of political mastermind. Um, and uh, he, he, uh, Despite being extremely healthy, he died uh, at age 58 because he tried to walk three miles through one of the worst blizzards that has ever occurred on the East Coast, uh, caught pneumonia, and uh, didn't last long, sadly. All right, that was, that was a, a fair amount of history, so uh, let's get back to buffer overflows. And... Uh, this term came up uh, in a previous class. And so let's look at what it actually means. A code injection attack. So what we've seen so far is, okay, we can overwrite the return address. We can send the program somewhere else, but if all that's going to do is make it uh, hit a segmentation fault, like that's not that exciting. Like, okay, we can crash the program, yay. Uh, but we can get a lot more mischief um, uh, if we have the following situation. So let's imagine we have, a function foo, it calls bar, um, and let's say that let's say that A is going to stand for the return address that bar is going to have. Like when bar finishes, it should come back to this address. 
to have a stack that looks something like this, where you have foos, uh, a stack frame, which is going to include uh, the return address A. So we're going to have pushed the return address A onto the stack. Um, and then uh, bar stack frame uh, is going to, let's say, just consist of this 64 byte array S. So um, S starts here. And so what an attacker can do is, assuming the attacker knows how far away S is from the return address, which we saw you can find out by looking at the assembly of the function. You can see how much space is allocated on the stack, and you can see what address is passed to the gets function. So the attacker knows kind of how far this is away. And so the attacker knows that, OK, we need kind of 64 plus kind of 8 bytes to overwrite all of this and then also overwrite the uh, return address. And then let's say the attacker also has some particular code that they want this program to execute. That's the code injection part. We don't want to just mess with the return address. We want to get the program to execute code that we, the attacker, designed. And the trick is we'll pass that code in as the input the program reads from the terminal. So it's like pass in whatever the appropriate bytes are. And so at the start of the buffer, what's written what gets reads and writes to the stack is the code that the attacker came up with. Let's say this takes uh, 24 bytes worth of exploit code. How do we go about changing the return address kind of when our exploit code uh, only takes 24 bytes to, to write in? Why? You just put in a bunch of other junk. Exactly. You just put in sort of kind of arbitrary nonsense padding. And then our goal is to have our exploit code get executed. And so we need to change the return address in such a way so that this exploit code will happen. Anyone have a suggestion for what we should change the return address to? The paper I put will begin once we inject it. Exactly. Yeah, we know we know where S starts. At least we can find that out with GDB. And it's just step through and kind of print out what is the address at the top of the stack. Uh, and so let's say let's call this address B. We want to overwrite A with address B. And then when bar returns, it's going to take the bytes that were the return address, pop them off the stack into our instruction pointer. And now instead of executing the next instruction at A, it's going to execute the instruction starting at B. And it's going to go through our exploit. Does that make sense? Cecilia? I'm confused though, because if this is all happening on the stack, I thought we couldn't execute things on the stack. Yeah, excellent observation. This only works if we don't have that security feature of making the stack not executable. So pre-2005 or 2003, when 64-bit uh, x86 came out, this would have worked on any x86 program, because they could not make the stack not executable. But yes, this uh, um, we have to get uh, kind of uh, more creative to compromise programs that don't let us execute things on the stack. Uh, there are 
Uh, there'll be a, a, a small part of our, our buffer overflow lab, which will be about uh, kind of alternate kinds of attacks. Um, but we're mainly going to focus on these code injection attacks um, because uh, they, uh, they're a good way to kind of deepen our understanding of exactly how things are laid out on the stack and exactly how procedure calls work and what return does and uh, a lot of these ideas we've been looking at. So, like, you know, when, when a function return and have the return address P, um, isn't the RSP the stack pointer going to be minus by the amount of the sign for the R stack? Then why wouldn't the, the code be considered not in the stack area? Yeah, so that's, that's a, a, a great point that our exploit code um, when we return, the stack pointer is going to be up here. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's possible that having the exploit code here uh, could be a problem if it's kind of out, if, if the, the system doesn't let us execute it here. Um, is there anywhere that we can put it with our buffer overflow where it wouldn't potentially get hung up on it? Um, that would certainly be convenient, uh, but we don't have any way to, those are, uh, we, we don't have any way to affect those with a buffer overflow. We can only affect space on the stack. Uh, but we, what we can do, because gets is going to just read however much input we give it, we could just write more input. So instead of putting the exploit code here, just have this whole thing be padding and put the exploit code above the return address and just have be, be that address instead. And now we've kind of located our exploit code. I mean, we, the, the takeaway here is that we can put whatever we want in memory from the start of the buffer onward. That there's no limit to how much data we can we can feed in. So we can kind of put anything we want from in, uh, in memory above the start of the buffer. Okay. Um, I just wondering, Brandon, like, is this illegal or can we, like, <laughs> uh, yes. So, uh, breaking uh, software and and um, uh, uh, committing crimes is not, <laughs> not legal. Um, there, in 1988, there was uh, a graduate student at, uh, I think, Cornell University uh, named Robert Morris, uh, who wrote, uh, what, who came up with what would become uh, the very first internet worm. Uh, where are we here? There we go. And uh, this, uh, took advantage of a protocol for getting the status of a computer connected to the internet um, because this protocol used gets to read an argument. Uh, and so this worm sent exploit code over the internet. This little service read it, read it in and this compromised the program and it compromised the machine that was targeted to then like, again, send out these worms to computers it was connected to. Um, this uh, worm invaded about 6,000 computers in a matter of hours. Um, 6,000 may, may, maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but that was 10% of the entire internet <laughs> at that time. Yeah. Um, and so here you see Robert Morris and, and an exhibit with a floppy disk of the, the code. Um, Robert Morris was the first person uh, ever convicted under the Computer Securities and Fraud Act, uh, sentenced to 400 hours of community service and a fine and uh, so on, but he's now tenured faculty at MIT, so <laughs> seemed to seem to work out all right, out, out all right for him. Um, so that was in 1988. 
Uh, fine. Do we know why he did it? Uh, he says he was trying to expose how bad internet security was at the time. Uh, but, I mean, I mean he, yeah, he, succe he succeeded, but uh, a, a judge did not did not see it as uh, community uh, for the common good, and he was he was convicted. Um, so uh, there's uh, another vulnerability which you may have uh, heard of from a few years ago. Uh, a uh, it's called the Heartbleed bug because there were computers connected to the internet uh, that uh, ran the little program called Heartbeat. And all it did was you could uh, uh, send a message to this computer to say, like, are you still alive? And, like, if you're still alive, uh, send back this reply. And this was used all over the place because it's useful to be able to like check is some computer connected to the internet you know, still up and running. Um, but in another example, like not validating user input, uh, this service didn't uh, uh, didn't check. Uh, you 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 told it both the thing you wanted it to reply and how long that thing was, and this program didn't check that these two matched. Uh, and so you'd say, you stood there, reply potato, replies potato, uh, reads potato out of memory, reply six letters, you stood there, bird, reply four letters. Are you still there, hat, reply 500 letters. And the service would just read 500 bytes of memory and set it on back. And this, these bytes of memory could include uh, sensitive data like passwords or um, trade secrets or you know whatever else. And this was a kind of catastrophic vulnerability. It affected Tumblr, Google, Yahoo, Dropbox, Netflix, Facebook. All of these companies were running services that had this vulnerability. And it took an enormous amount of time and money to like scramble and, and fix this um, when it was discovered. And again, just it was possible to read arbitrary stuff in memory uh, because user input was just trusted without checking. A uh, couple other, a little stranger examples um, from researchers at University of Washington. Um, in 2010, they figured out that you could wirelessly hack a car using a buffer overflow. Um, so it connects to the car, you could give an input that would overflow a buffer, and you could do like minor things like disable the brakes, unlock the doors, turn the engine on or off. Um, uh, and uh, these these are these are some of the, the folks that um, that did that research. Other uh, other UW folks realized that uh, there was vulnerable code on DNA sequencing machines, such that if you fed in uh, uh, an exploit encoded in DNA, it would overflow a buffer and take control of the sequencing machine. Um, and this is just to illustrate that. Potentially vulnerable code is running on kind of anything that is running software is potentially vulnerable uh, to these kind of attacks. Uh, you may notice uh, this guy present in, in both pictures, Carl Kosher, a very interesting guy. Uh, I overlapped with him at the University of Washington. He does a lot of cool security stuff. Um, all right, so have a few minutes to talk about. Um, ways that we can deal with these buffer overflow problems. Like we established that they're they're rampant, they can let you do all sorts of nasty stuff. How do we how do we predict against them? We already talked about one way. Make the stack not executable. That gets rid of one kind of one kind of attack where you just put code onto the stack. Um, Last time, I briefly mentioned uh, another kind of defense against uh, kind of attacking a program's memory. Uh, does anyone remember what that was? That's the one where um, the, 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 the one where you randomize the uh, address. So like I mean, you run it, the address is random. Exactly. There, it's something called address space randomization, um, or address space layout randomization, and it's um, Every time you run the program, it the, the like the start of the stack and the start of the heap and so on is sort of 
offset by a random amount. And so when we were doing this code injection attack, uh, it relied on the fact that we could know what address our injected code was going to be at. But if it's randomized and that address is different every time, this sort of thing where we kind of know ahead of time what address stuff is going to be at becomes a lot harder to do. Um, there's something that, uh, another thing that is built into uh, modern compilers um, is uh, something called a stack canary. Uh, and this takes its name from the uh, Technique that, that say coal miners use, where there could be dangerous gases in a coal mine, uh, and so they would literally take a canary bird into the mine with them because it, the bird was far more sensitive to these gases than they were, than humans are. And so if you saw the bird passed out, it was a sign that the air was bad and you should get out of the mine. And so, kind of a canary. Uh, or a canary in a coal mine became this phrase to me like something that signals you that stuff has gone wrong. Why? Because it, yeah, it's the. I mean that that one of causing problems with the idea was that yeah, canaries like to sing, and because they like to sing, and also they are small, that air exchange, and because they're small, their lungs will take up the gases really fast. And so when you hear the canary stop singing, leave. But sometimes birds just stop singing because they want to. Yes, the uh, birds birds are, are inscrutable like that. Um, so the way that this is used to predict against uh, buffer overflows is um, you may have noticed that when I compiled, I actually had to turn off this thing called a stack protector. Um, and if I look at the the version of um, Okay. If I look at the version of the echo function with the stack protector turned on, we see a few strange instructions have been inserted at the beginning uh, and end of the function. And the basic idea is you take some random value that the operating system would prevent an attacker from reading ahead of time. And you put that on the stack before the stack starts, uh, before the, the function uh, does its work, and then at the end of the function, you copy that value um, off the stack and you check whether it is equal to the original random value. Where if this kind of canary value has been changed, you know some mischief has occurred. Part of the stack that should not have been changed was changed when this program, program was run. And if I run this kind of more protected version of the program. And instead of just segmentation faulting, because eventually something went wrong, it actually detects uh, that the stack has been modified in a potentially dangerous way. And yeah, which is this kind of idea of overwriting return addresses, uh, sometimes called stack smashing. Uh, and so it says, some bad thing may have happened end the program there. Um, the last, what I'll leave you with, and uh, what you might take away for how to prevent these attacks, is we can write better code. We can use fgets instead of gets. We can, uh, this also applies to stir copy versus stir n copy. Something that copies a potentially uh, very large string versus something that we tell explicitly how many bytes to copy a number of these sort of functions. All right, that will do it for today. Uh, the uh, lab due 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, you can use uh, late days to send me an email. Uh, I hope you have a great midterm break. Uh, I won't have office hours on Monday uh, since that's break, but I will Tuesday evening, so I'll see you then or Wednesday.